Paranormal Dimensions is a regular feature on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network. Any opinions or comments made by any guest are their own, and they do not necessarily reflect any of the presenters' or network's opinions. It is my firm opinion that these sightings should be investigated most meticulously. You don't believe that these flying saucers actually exist, do you? And how can you be so certain they don't, Mr. Chump? Well, I, I just don't believe it. Our minds should be open on all subjects. Wrong conclusions are usually the result of lack of comprehensive analysis. Of course. This is Eric Mintel. You're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network, the UK's biggest paranormal radio network. And this is Paranormal Dimensions with David Young. As you become the, by today, the first contact for all of these individuals listening, there has been a, um, somehow you're the guy. And um, that's because you've earned that, that uh, trust and reliability and connection with those people and and you're the right guy to introduce them to this re-emerging powerful energy and let them be part of it hello and welcome to the show thank you for that intro eric it's eric mintel who's a jazz musician and a paranormal investigator and thank you for those kind words ben vonderheide who was a guest on the show just before Christmas. I've got another wonderful guest for you today. Her name's Lisa O'Hara. She's got a book out called Abducted and Furious, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a, in a little while. But first of all, I'd like to say thank you for the uh, messages and emails and things that I get, mostly suggesting guests, etc. Now, anyone that listens to this show regularly, a couple of shows back I played a recording by a friend of mine named Preston Williams. It was his um, reciting of Chief Seattle's letter to U.S. President Franklin Pierce in 1855. Uh, it's very touching, very spiritual, very moving. Um, I've been asked to play it again, so here it is. The great chief in Washington sends word that he wishes to buy our land. The great chief also sends us words of friendship and goodwill. This is kind of him since we know he has little need of our friendship in return. But we will consider your offer. For we know that if we do not sell, the white man may come with guns and take our land. How can you buy or sell the sky, the warmth of the land? The idea is strange to us. If we do not own the freshness of the air and the sparkle of the water... How can you buy them? Every part of this earth is sacred to my people. Every shining pine needle, every sandy shore, every mist in the dark woods, every clearing and every humming insect is holy in the memory and experience of my people. The sap which courses through the trees carries the memories of the red man. So when the great chief in Washington sends word that he wishes to buy our land, he asks much of us. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the sons of the earth. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. 
whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. But we will consider your offer to go to the reservation you have for my people. We will live apart and in peace. It matters little where we spend the rest of our days. Our children have seen their fathers humbled in defeat. Our warriors have felt shame. And after defeat, they turn their days in idleness and contaminate their bodies with sweet foods and strong drinks. It matters little where we spend the rest of our days. They are not many. A few more hours, a few more winters, and none of the great tribes that once lived on this earth or that now roam in small bands in the woods will be left to mourn the graves of a people once as powerful and hopeful as yours. But why should I mourn the passing of my people? Tribes are made of men, nothing more. Men come and go like the waves of the sea. Even the white man whose God walks and talks with him as friend to friend cannot be exempt from the common destiny. One thing we know which the white man may one day discover, our God is the same God. You may think now that you own him as you wish to own our land, but you cannot. He is the God of man, and his compassion is equal for the red man and the white. This earth is precious to him, and to harm the earth is to heap contempt on its creator. The whites too shall pass, perhaps sooner than all other tribes. Continue to contaminate your bed, and you will one night suffocate in your own waste. But in your perishing you will shine brightly, fired by the strength of the God who brought you to this land, and for some special purpose gave you dominion over this land and over the red man. That destiny is a mystery to us, for we do not understand when the buffalo are all slaughtered, the wild horses are tamed, and the view of the ripe hills blotted by talking wires. Where is the thicket? Gone. Where is the eagle? Gone. And what is it to say goodbye to the swift pony in the hunt? The end of living and the beginning of survival. So we will consider your offer to buy the land. If we agree, it will be to secure the reservation you have promised. There perhaps we may live out our brief days as we wish. When the last red man has vanished from this earth, and his memory is only the shadow of a cloud moving across the prairie, these shores and forests will still hold the spirits of my people for they love this earth as a newborn loves its mother's heartbeat. So, if we sell our land, love it as we've loved it, care for it as we've cared for it, hold in your mind the memory of the land as it is when you take it. And with all your strength, with all your mind, with all your heart, preserve it for your children and love it as God loves us all. One thing we know, our God is the same God. This earth is precious to him. Even the white man cannot be exempt from the common destiny. We may be brothers after all. We shall see. There we are, Preston Williams. I think you can all agree with me that it's uh, very touching and very moving and I think quite relevant to today's times. Preston has his new album out called Eight Mile Stair. Uh, unfortunately that track isn't on it, but um, well worth a listen. Also now, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, my email address is davidyoung2qn at yahoo.co.uk That's davidyoung2qn, all one word at yahoo.co.uk OK, I'll just talk a little bit about today's guest. It's Lisa O'Hara. She has a book out, as I said, called Abducted and Furious of And How I Fought Back and How You Can Too. She describes the reasons that she wrote the book, and they are threefold. 
first, to write about her experiences, and second, to raise awareness, and third, to help anyone that has been abducted by ETs or the military, which is quite intriguing. I wanted to be able to share the information from my spirit guides on how to fight back against being abducted to as many people as possible, as quickly as possible. As more and more people awaken to the truth, they will need resources. We need more people to speak out, but we also need tools to fight back. Once I found the tools, I used them and they worked. I knew that I could not keep them to myself. I had to find my people and share the tools. Sounds easy, but it is difficult in a world where no one talks about being abducted by ETs. So, I'd like to introduce to you Lisa O'Hara. Hello Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, I really appreciate it. No, I've been really looking forward to this one, and I'm quite intrigued about your the title of your book, which came out uh, last year, 2020, uh, Abducted and Furious, How I Fought Back and How You Can Too. Now, <laughs> it's quite an intriguing title, and obviously uh, you're talking about being abdu- abducted by aliens, and uh, I'm intrigued to hear your story. All right. Well, um, I wrote, I wanted to grab the people with the title. Someone had told me that I needed to have a mo- an emotional title. Mm. And uh, at first I was trying to figure out what I, how I wanted to, to describe it. Um, and so I, um, thought, you know, it is about abduction and, uh, and I am furious. So why not abducted and furious? Mm. That grabs well, I think you would be. Everyone. I think everyone yeah. would be, wouldn't they? <laughs> Yeah, and it tells everyone, you know, what the book is about without delving into the, you know, I mean, my original title I wanted to call it was Leveling the Playing Field, but that doesn't really grab you. (laughs) Yeah, and it doesn't really explain what it's about either, does it? (laughs) Exactly, and so I like titles, you know, that tell you what it's about, you know, enough so that you actually know. But doesn't uh, doesn't have too little information, so you can't figure out what this is about. So, Hmm. um, so, do you want me to go start from the beginning, the absolutely, very beginning? Yeah, absolutely. Please take it wherever you want. <laughs> um, okay, so when I was a little girl, I would have unusual experiences, but, you know, like all children, I mean, you can't figure out what these things are. And, um, you know, you can't really, I mean, for me, I couldn't really wrap my head around some of these things either. Um, so, I, for instance, when I was 11, I saw a round, white, like bright white circle, and it would come into my bed, and I would instinctively know that I was to be frightened of that, and I would start yelling out, oh, no, oh, no. Um, but that, you know, happened infrequently, and so who do you tell about that? I remember my dad yelling from the living room, be quiet in there, you know, <laughs> so go to sleep. So, you know, at some point you have to wonder, you know, how much are you going to tell other people about these things? And also, if they don't happen over and over, I mean, it's not like um, you can label it as anything. So that's one of the things that happened to me. When I was 10, I was uh, I was living in a foreign country at that time, and my parents moved around all the time, uh, every year or so. So I was always new and always in a new school. And so um, I was I kept having this daydream and it kept coming back over and over and over for a week. And the daydream was that our maids, because we lived in Turkey and that's during that time you had to have maids to get around to go to the market and that kind of thing. Hmm. Um, So our maid was walking up the hill to our house. That was it. (laughs) That was the daydream. (laughs) And um, and I hadn't seen this lady in a while. So either she was like out of town or there was some circumstance that she wouldn't normally be walking up the street to us or she had quit. But lo and behold, after a week, after having that daydream, which would not go away, I could not get rid of it. Suddenly it came true. So that that was the only time that happened when I was 10 and it didn't happen again uh, until I was 16. I was getting ready to uh, I, I finally I was in my senior nearing my senior year of high school and i was in this one school in california and um i was thinking oh my gosh i hope i last hope my dad doesn't move us anywhere because i'm about to finish you know in the school Hmm. and when you move around all the time you're constantly um you're in that position of not never knowing what if your education is spotty or Hmm. You know, why, why were, you, if you don't mind me asking, why were you moving around your family? Was, was he a military man? 
He wasn't. He was um, actually he he did mechanical engineer. Uh, he was a mechanical engineer. He built gold leaching plants and copper smelters. Oh, so he was a construction engineer. Right. But um, because I couldn't really say that, uh, all of my friends thought that my dad worked for the CIA. I see. Because I couldn't describe. First of all, I couldn't describe what he did because people, you know, little kids ask each other, "What did your dad do?" Well. Mm. I couldn't say that all that, and I didn't understand it, so I would just say, I don't know. Mm. And because we moved around all the time, um, which he did because he was, you know, chasing the money. So if you move around, you know, if you're taking contract jobs or you're, you know, moving your family to go to a foreign country or wherever, you... um you know, you make more money. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, I mean, who knows? Right. Maybe he was working for the CIA and he just told <laughs> That's true. It's true. Yeah, I asked him <laughs> later on and he denied it. So, But you never know. That might have been his cover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, anyway, so at this point I was extremely worried that we were going to move. And um, I started having that daydream. And I, I was worried <laughs> because at first I thought I was causing it. You know, when I, when I had that, when I was um, in, well, 10 years old, I thought I was causing this to happen. So here I am, 16, getting ready to go into my senior year of high school. That daydream starts popping up that I'm moving to a foreign country. I'm moving for, to a foreign country. And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> um, but, yep, it happened again. I moved to the Philippines my senior year of high school. So, so these kind of things are just one-offs, right? Um, you know, in between a sprinkling, I had, you know, a day, de- de- a dream that actually came through the next day. But none of these things actually ever were a thing that I could put a label on and say, well, I must be psychic. I must be intuitive. I'm seeing the future. You know, to me, they were just strange occurrences. Hmm. Um, one of the things that would happen too, and I found out one of my sisters, this happens to her too. Um, when I'm in a relationship at a, either a, like a work relationship or, um, or an actual love relationship or any relationship, actually, I'll feel a certain feeling and it feels kind of like as you touch a switch on the doorway to turn on a light. When that switch goes off, that relationship is ending. Oh, <laughs> so, really? Just like that? Yeah. Yeah. So I always know when my relationships are ending and, uh, you know, when I was young, since I moved around all the time, I would try to hang on to them as long as possible. Mm. But I've learned you have to let them go because it's the end of the relationship. Yeah. Um, and the same with jobs. So when I once I felt that uh, felt that switch go off, I knew it was time to move on. Uh, but you don't always want to. Right. Because you enjoy something about your job. Yeah, and relationships, relationships. Of course, you know. Yeah, sometimes, <laughs> yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, sometimes you just know, it's that intuition, you know that's the end of it, and uh, you just do that. But uh, I suppose some people are more intuitive than others in that respect. <laughs> I, I guess so, but, you know, I, I, it was funny, I was talking to my sister about it, and she was like, yeah, that happens to me too. But yeah. I didn't ever meet anyone who said that they knew this. Uh, this also what would happen with people who are about to die. And so um, that might have been a little inkling into my, um, you know, later when I found out I was a psychic medium because mm. I would feel like, oh, my gosh, if you're smart, you'll take a picture of this person right now as you remember them. And it would be really, really strong. And I would probably get um, two or three uh, little taps on my shoulder. Do it now. Do it now. <laughs> and if I didn't do it, I really regretted it. So I started listening to that. <laughs> And started taking photos of the people who I knew were going to die, um, wow. <laughs> and that kind of thing. So, so these are just little weird things that happen. But you can't, you know, you can't. Um, and you might think other people have this too, or you might not even understand it well enough. Mm. So, so things go on. I get married, and uh, and then I got divorced later. But when I was married to this guy, um, I would go to sleep sometimes before he did because we went to school and worked uh, also at the same time and went to college. And um, if I fell asleep before he did, as soon as he crossed the threshold of the room, I would sit up and start screaming as if someone was killing me. Hmm. Now, I couldn't figure out what these were. I went to therapy after my divorce, and um, all I could remember was a black rectangle. That's all. 
Um, and so I kept trying to go back with the therapist. What does this mean? What does this mean? She she wanted to back burner it, and I never did figure out what that meant. Um, so, you know, these are just things, right, that you carry around with you, and you think, hmm, I wonder what that is. Um, so I moved to from California to Arizona um, in 2011, and um, I start trying to figure out what am I? What what are these things that I know? Um, and I read a book about how to know if you're a medium, and um, I thought, well, I could be a medium, but you know, it's like horoscopes. Some of these things are kind of vague, hmm. and they're not very, you know, they're not specific enough to me. So I just thought, ah. I could be a medium. I could not be a medium, you know. So I did start hearing knocking on the wall as soon as I had that thought of I could not be a medium or maybe I'm not, you know. So I so I started meditating a lot because I was talking to another guy who either was a medium or seemed to be more spiritual than I was. And he told me, you need to meditate and just be patient, which I'm not very patient. <laughs> so... <laughs> So I did do that. I meditated for quite a while, and I finally found out the name of my spirit guide, and I asked what my purpose was. And my spirit guide's name is Korig, and he said that my purpose was to be a beacon of light. And I did not know what that meant, and I'm not sure if I do now either. In my book, I think that I might know what it is, but I'm not sure. You know, because these things that you hear in your head, you know, it could be true, could not be true. We don't know. Mm. Um, so... So after that, um, I did hear about a person who was a medium who who I had access to. I was getting my hair colored, and um, I found out that a person in there, her boss, was a medium. So I thought, hey, I should just sign up with her. So I signed up, and um, I went to her because my mom had since passed away and uh, to talk to her about my mom. And she said, oh, guess what? You're less like me. <laughs> You're a medium. Uh-huh. So thinking that I was a medium at that point, um, because another medium had validated it, I then went on a journey of trying to figure out this whole medium thing and, you know, if that's something I wanted to do, if I wanted to connect to spirits on a regular basis. And, you know, I worked at it for a little while. Uh-huh. But at some point, I was meditating before bed, and I was talking to my spirit guide. And um, I said, oh, my gosh, Korg, there is an extremely negative presence in my room right now. What is that? And they said, he said, oh, it's the greys. They've taken all your eggs. That's why you don't have children. And they're here to take you right now. Wow. And I was just Mm. floored. Well, you would be. (laughs) I mean, that, yeah. when you when you were traveling around the, the uh, experiment with uh, you know talk about your mediumship, were you doing se- seances or speaking at venues or? No, no, I wasn't. Just, doing just that within well. yourself, sort of thing. Yeah, I was just going to the medium, and she was telling me uh, she was basically giving me like a personalized um, tutor tutoring hmm. of how she connects to the spirits and how I should connect to the spirits. And she would, you know, say, you got to do this. You got to feel it. You know, you got to feel the connection and feel, you know, their heart chakra to your heart chakra or hmm. to the third chakra, or I guess it's, yeah, third chakra, which I guess is the like the belly button chakra. Yeah. Um, you have to connect those two. It's sort of, and the way she described it, it's sort of like an elevator. You know, those old-fashioned elevators where you, I guess there were people that would make sure the elevator ended up on the floor and not too far up or too far down. Sure. And so it was explained to me, like, an out el- two elevators facing each other, you're trying to connect on the same level of the floor so that you're exactly identical. And um, it was hard for me to do that, which I thought was strange because I had spoken both to my mother and my grandmother, and it wasn't that difficult. It seemed fairly easy. So for me to be, maybe I felt put on the spot because one of the things, and all, kudos to all mediums, is that when you, when someone comes to you in pain and you're trying to help them connect to their loved one, you have to say what you hear in your head to someone else that you don't know 
And it's really, really scary. Mm. I mean, yeah. for me, the um, actual responsibility felt very, very heavy because I didn't want to be wrong, you know, on something I said. So I didn't, I felt very frightened by that whole, you know, feeling of what if I'm wrong? What if I hurt them? Mm. You know, this is a sensitive situation. And eventually um, I I was also getting this feeling like that, that, you know, like with the light switch, um, I was starting to, at first I saw the picture of me have, being a medium and also having clients. And then that picture got a little faded and a little faded and pretty soon. It showed me that I wasn't going to do that anymore. So the medium said, you have a choice. You have a crossroads here. Um, you can go towards the mediumship or you can go to the unknown. And whenever I'm at a crossroads, I always go to the unknown. So I said, OK, that's it for me with the mediumship. I'm just going to go to the unknown. I don't know where I'm going, but I'd rather do that than be in, in the mediumship. I don't see myself in this um, in this job anymore. <clears throat> mm. So, so at that point, after I realized that I was, had been taken by aliens, um, I went to the medium and I said, you know, I really want, I am, so after being really, really scared by it and feeling like I was unsafe and helpless and feeling like I couldn't ever be, feel safe again, because most people, what well, we go to bed, we, Go, you know, wake up the next, maybe have some dreams, we wake up the next day, we go to work, you know, we come home, we have dinner, you know what I mean? We have a routine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but that, you know, doesn't fit into my routine. Plus, there were things happening to me that I didn't even know about and how long it's been going on and all of that sort of thing. So I told her, I don't want this to happen anymore. I'm really mad. Um, and I need help figuring out how to get out of this. I mean, there must be a way out. And so she tried everything she could think of. Uh, you know, we tried to break soul contracts. Have you ever heard of soul contracts? Well, I have, yeah. I don't know too much about it, but I've heard the term, yeah. Okay, well, the the thing is, is that people, a lot of people who uh, are in, the, in that category of love and light uh, is... They think that you have created a contract when you came to the earth, and that is basically your fault for your circumstances. Mm -hmm. So you have chosen this life, you've chosen to be abducted, and you, <clears throat> you know, you've signed this, you've signed up. Yeah. Signed up I've, I've heard it described different ways, but not as, a, as that particular um, title. But uh, yeah, I, I do know what you, what you mean now. Yeah. I've heard that people talk about it before on this show too. Yeah. So um, when I, you know, I just thought that doesn't sound like something I would do. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't feel like me, you know. So. And I think that. Oh, but that's the earth you, isn't it? That's the earth you, not the spiritual you. That's year. true. But you know what? Um, and maybe I did, and I I signed up so that I could get out of it. I don't know. <laughs> but um, you know, so she tried changing the Akashic records, which is some sort of giant library, like an interstellar. Did you see that movie with Matthew McConaughey? I did. Yeah, very good. That that movie that. That big giant card catalog uh, floating in space kind of reminded me of what I would imagine the Akashic re records look like. Mm. Um, but anyway, so she tried that. We did, um, we asked our angel Michael and our angels to help us. We respected our, respectfully demanded our right to free will, our sovereignty. We, um, we did everything. We basically did everything. And then in the meantime, I was searching on the web looking for other things that people had tried to try it, too, because you never know. I didn't want to leave any stone unturned. So I kept working at it and working at it and working at it. And um, she wanted me to feel like it was my fault that this was happening and that I just wasn't being demanding enough. I wasn't setting sacred space well enough. And so I just kept thinking there must be another way. Um in the meantime, I was also um, talking to her about healing. I was learning healing. Um, I'm one of these people that are all in. So if somebody says, hey, does this make sense to you? Does this feel right to you? Let's try this class. And I really like it. Then I'll buy all the books and 
I'll spend a lot of time and a lot of energy into that thing, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I was actually um, into healing. And so she taught a angelic healing class, which I did like. I liked it. It was an eight-hour class. She also taught another class called La Ho Chi. La Ho Chi is a hands-on healing where you actually use certain hand positions on your own body and also on others. And what happens is after you've used La Ho Chi uh, quite a few times, your hands get hot whenever you work on someone. And it's pretty cool. Hmm. Have you heard of anything like that? Well, I have like heard, in fact, I've been told, <laughs> I mean, I've never experienced, I've never put it to use, but I've been told that I've got um, healing hands, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, my, my, my hands are always hot. Uh all I can say is I've, I've I've tried it a couple of times with my wife when she's had uh, like a headache or something or an aching shoulder, and she says that she can feel the heat coming out my hands, and it seems to cure a headache or a aching shoulder or something. So uh, it's not something I've sort of I've really mentioned much to anyone, but uh, right, right. <laughs> but I I have been told by a medium or a couple of mediums that I've got that power. But there you go. I've never actually oh. used it. Why not? Why don't you go for it? Um, yeah, you well, maybe, maybe I should play around with it more. I don't know if it's the right term to say play around with it, but um, maybe I should try and um, develop it. I don't know. I mean, I I found it uh, I found it hard to, for someone to be telling me that I had some sort of a special, you know, special powers, if you like. <laughs> you know, I don't yes. consider myself anything special, and I didn't want yeah. to go around thinking that uh, telling everyone that I've got healing hands when you know, I was going to get this look and think, well, you're you're mad, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know the feeling. <laughs> So, um, yeah, well, that's really awesome. I, that pe I had been told, like, my entire life that I was a healer. Mm. And I didn't believe it either because, I mean, it's like, what? How do you get this stuff? I mean, somebody told me it was because my aura was a peach color and that told them that I was oh, a right. healer. Oh, well, you think to but yourself, why me, don't you? you know, yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, you know, what does that even mean? I mean, does it mean that when I touch people, they're healed? Do I just need to look at them? I mean, they don't, they weren't very specific. And that's mm. another problem that I had a hard time wrapping my head around was that it was so vague. You know? Yeah. It just doesn't, it doesn't feel like it's sticking on to me. Why well, do you find that you, um, attract people, people uh, kind of, uh, I mean I've had it, I mean, I'm not saying that I've got anything special, but I've had people that kind of get drawn to you, do you, do you find that sometimes? Absolutely, yes I actually yes. had, I, I actually had it to, well I've moved recently, I've moved home recently and we started walking the dogs over a nice uh, um, area and I kept seeing this chap um, walking yeah, he does a walk in the area for every morning, or we see him some mornings. And strangely enough, he, he we, we stopped to talk one morning, and he said, I've been drawn to talk to you <laughs> for some reason. Because, and then I, we started talking about paranormal things. And um, he didn't know that I did a paranormal show. I said, well, I do paranormal dimensions. He said, really? He said, I listen to that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you didn't uh, even recognize your voice. Well, no, I, well that's it. That, that's the funny thing about it. I mean, also uh, on my picture for my, my my original picture, I didn't have this uh, face covering I've grown, now, <laughs> which I've grown now, which you can see. Um, <laughs> but I found that quite strange. So he said, "Yeah, well, yeah." I said, "I'm David Young." He said, "Really?" You know, and it, that to me was strange because. Well, you know, uh, when you, when the show goes out, you don't, right, it's going out kind of worldwide, but you don't really expect to bump into people that are actually listening to it, if you see what I mean. Right. We're not sort of on, <laughs> on the mainstream TV or something, you know. <laughs> but, uh, so that, that That's to me was, was rather surreal, yeah. And then he told me about a lot of his history. I'm hoping that, I'm hoping to get him on this show actually in a few weeks. So, uh, but anyway, we don't want to go. This is your show today. So, but, no, no, it's but okay. I'll just sort of throw I'm, that in there. I just, I wonder if you do get that, um, um, attraction. I actually do. Some... It's really funny. But, uh, well, I never understood it, but yeah. Um, actually we had, um, my entire family, if we go into a store that is completely empty, there is nobody in there. Within five minutes, it's filled with people. 
It's like we call it the curse because it happens everywhere and it happens to all of us. Yeah. I mean, uh, do you have you ever had the thing where I'm sorry, I'm going off again, but do you ever have that feeling where you get a song come into your head and then all of a sudden it comes on the radio or, or it gets yes. played in, in, a, <laughs> in a store or something? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And another thing that used to happen to me all the time. Now, um, I'm, you should know this. I am uh, directionally challenged. So I don't know the directions to anywhere. I don't know which way I'm going most of the <laughs> You're time. You're a bit like my wife, then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You she does, she doesn't know her left and right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Do not talk map with me because I will not be able to respond. <laughs> um, but, um, I remember I would be on the street. Every day, somebody would ask me for directions. And it was really strange. I mean, out of all the people walking around on the street, somebody would see me and say, that person must know where they're going. <laughs> and they would ask me, they would ask me the time. Now, uh, you know, not everyone wears wrist watches all the time, but there would be times when somebody, when I would be walking in the midst of tons of people, and somebody would pick me out, and they couldn't see that I was wearing a watch and ask me the time. And then um, when I used to stand in line at the movies, I was in this long line. I think we were going to see Star Wars or something like that. And people would walk up to me and ask me for information. Yeah. And the people behind me would say, do you know these people? Yeah. And I would say, no, I've never seen them before. And I said, and I don't have information uh, across <laughs> my forehead either. But, yeah, that happened all yeah, the time. I know time. exactly what you mean. I've had, I mean, I don't travel by train very much, but I've had people walk, you know, you're, you're standing on a platform amongst loads of people, and people will walk up to you to ask something. You know, it, it's it's a really strange thing. You think, well, why have you, why have you chosen me and not one of these other people? <laughs> yeah, there's something about us. Maybe we look approachable or well, maybe I don't know. There is something like that, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. It happens so often. Um, another thing that would happen to me, but only in California, so I always wondered about this, is that they would um, so somebody would come up to me and go, "Oh my gosh, I do you know you look just like my sister's cousin's boyfriend's mother, <laughs> yeah, oh, or right. something like that, you yeah. know." And so I would get that. Um, I would get that probably four or five times a month. The entire time I lived in California, and I lived in California for over 30 years. Right. So did, so they, five actually, times did they actually think you were that person when they walked up? No, they're just people that look like me there. Now I've always said that I thought that's where my clones live, but because I moved to Arizona and I've been here 10 years, nobody has ever said that to me. <laughs> that's weird. Just there, just in California, not here. <laughs> Yeah, I think there are different type of people in California. I'm sorry, sorry if anyone's listening in California, but <laughs> well, there are, but uh, but it's not their fault. It's just their government. Yeah, I know. Thing. Yeah, yeah, they they are sort of. Uh, yeah, well, we won't go into that. But uh. but you know what? The good thing about California, and I actually miss that about Arizona, uh, is that it's very um, diverse. Oh yeah, so do that. And Arizona is very non-diverse, mm. and I actually miss it. I mean, I sometimes go to have uh, go hang out at places that have like Chinese food, you know, like dim sum and mm. other things like that, or the Chinese market. But I actually feel comfortable there. Yeah, I do know. I do know what you I mean. Cause I've actually environment. Yeah, I've actually traveled, uh, you know, through, throughout California and Arizona. I can see exactly what you mean. Yeah, they're very. It's a very different culture. It is. It is. It's funny. I didn't think I'd miss that that much, but I really do, and I really feel for the people who are people of color because they probably really notice it. Mm, yeah. But I'm not a person of color, so I notice it, but I'm not as affected by it as they are. But hopefully that'll change because I think a lot of people from California were have moved into Arizona, so. <laughs> I wonder why. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Yeah, I mean, what you mentioned about the greys taking your eggs, I mean, that is a, that is an awful thing to have happened. So that's a, that's in a physical sense, no, no, that, that you're actually physically abducted, yes? Yes, yes, I am physically abducted. And I actually figured, finally figured it out. I mean, you know, I was told that, but you know, your mind doesn't want to believe it. Your mind doesn't want to go there. Uh, and also, it's frightening to think that there are things going on when you're asleep that you have no clue of. Mm. Um, but one of the things that I noticed or finally started noticing was that um, 
well, that my clothes smelled funny. And I finally narrowed it down to that I was actually leaving every night and I was putting on those clothes and leaving with those clothes. But, you know, initially it was sort of like, this is really weird. Why do my clothes smell so bad? You know, here I am. It smells like B.O. and feet. I mean, I Mm. didn't smell like I smelled these yesterday and they smelled fine. Or, you know, these just came out of the washer and my husband folded them. And now they and they are sitting there folded up. So they haven't been worn by anyone. But yet. They smell like B.O. and feet. And that's exactly what had started happening was that I started realizing that there were quite a few clues. Um, but at first, I didn't really know what I was looking at because, you know, when st- stuff starts repeating, you, you say to yourself, oh, my gosh. I mean, you mm. go through all the normal, you know, explanations of what it could be. Sure. And then finally, you have to arrive at the I'm leaving. Mm. I am leaving my house in these clothes. Well, and coming back, it's certainly, them up. it's certainly not the way a lady would like to smell, is it? You know, be open feet. No. <laughs> no. It was pretty bad, too. It was almost like wherever, wherever I went, I was there for a couple of days mm. because and I, the environment might have smelled like this. So that's one of the things that happened to me. Um, I have to go back to talk about my, my other things. I have to go backwards a little bit. Well, one of the things that I was doing was I was reading everything. Uh, I'm a reader, a pretty voracious reader, and um, one of the things I do when I read people's books is I read, if they mention a book, I look it up, and if it looks good, I read it too. Mm. I read everything they've talked about in their books. And I came across, I was reading a book, and I cannot remember the book to save my life, but that book had uh, a, um, a, a reference to Psychic Warrior by David Morehouse, and he was a... Um, he was a guy in the military, and it was a really, really brave book, I thought, because it talked about him getting shot in the head and also um, then seeing an angel. And, you know, the military doesn't really aren't very open minded. So they thought he was crazy. But the gist of the book is that he um, was doing something called remote viewing. And remote viewing is when you use your mind to travel and you actually enhance and open up your psychic abilities by doing that. Um, I thought I was so intrigued by this because, you know, as a kid, I was very interested in psychic abilities and, you know, paranormal stuff. Um, I never imagined in my wildest dreams that I was actually in it, but, <laughs> but at the time, I was very intrigued. And so when I read this, I just thought it was fascinating. So, of course, you know, I joined his uh, group on Facebook and also um, I logged on to his website. I bought his book on how to become a remote viewer. And there are a couple of types of remote viewing. There is one called controlled remote viewing, which is very linear and very structured. And I'm a bit of a structureaholic. I like structure. I like linear linear learning. So I thought, oh, that one, that one looks good to me. So I, I, I used it and I had some interesting experiences. Then I had, uh, then I tried his next version, which is called extended remote viewing. And that's less structured, but it's more like, uh, flying as, as that's what he claims on his, on his website. Um, in both of these times, I had very, very strange experiences. Um, the first experience I had was using controlled remote viewing or coordinated remote viewing. And it's coordinates because they assign a number to a target. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to look at a target um, in your mind and describe it. So, you know, I did it a couple of times and, you know, you have to have um, have an eye patch on or, you know, eye mask on and you also have to ha- listen to some music prior and so I did that and first I smelled lavender and I thought that's really weird is, you, is that my deodorant mm-hmm. you know and um but you know it went away so the next time that it happened I was in this state uh with my mind and suddenly I was in a room a different room I was not in my own room I was in a room with all these men in white uh white um shirts and khaki pants so business casual (laughs) and i was sitting in front of a big computer monitor which is an old one a crt 
and they were all standing around and they were drinking coffee uh, from their styrofoam cups. Now, uh, it was odd because I don't drink coffee and my husband doesn't drink coffee, so I know that was real. So wherever I was, I was in this room and and I, then I heard, oh, there you are. And then I felt like I was plagued by remote viewers uh, coming into my house and following me around and that kind of thing. And I discovered through trial and error, and that's how I work, I do everything by trial and error, um, that they were actual remote viewers following me. And there were certain types. There was uh, human remote viewers that sounded when they hit... Um, when they hit the atmosphere, which I found out later is called the membrane, uh, it sounds like the thunk, the human ones do thunk when you hit a, your, you thunk a watermelon to see if it's good. Hmm. That's how you know a human remote viewer is in the room. Hmm. Um, your house, if it cracks, you know, sometimes you hear cracks in the middle of the night or cracks yeah. if it's windy. It's one thing if it's windy, but if it's not windy, uh, that means it's an ET remote viewer. Wow. And then later I started hearing, um, I started hearing snaps and that happened, that turned out to be something called a invisible being. Um, so I started being hounded and harassed by these remote viewers all the time. And I was pretty annoyed because there's nothing worse, I think, than feeling like people are watching you or every move and reporting on you. And that's what I eventually determined that they're doing, is that they're actually telling somebody something I'm doing. Hmm. May I ask you something at this point? Have you ever spoken to um, a Solaris Blue Raven? I I asked to get on her show, but I haven't gotten a response, so... Ah, I shall have a talk with her. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) uh, I, I, I really think you should talk to her. I would like to. Yeah, <laughs> I, would very I'll, much I'll, like I will to. arrange that. <laughs> okay, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> I just thought because uh, you're talking about remote viewing, because she has actually has been a remote viewer in the past, and she was very heavily affected by it. Um, so yes, I will. I'm sure that uh, if I have a word with her, she will get you on the show, and I think you will have a good talk with her. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Thank yes, you. Yes, I will do that. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, so the next time I tried extended remote viewing, um, I was kind of nervous because, you know, I felt like I opened a Pandora's box uh, mm-hmm. with the first time. Um, the What happened was just as I was about to see something, um, somebody, not, and I was in the room alone, touched the outside of my eye mask and it was black. I couldn't see anything. So I really get the feeling that whoever it is doesn't want me to go there. Um, And I don't know if it's good or bad. I mean, it sort of spurred me on to do um, do it more. But I actually my life has changed so much from since writing this book that I, um, you know, I've gone in different directions. Mm. And uh, so I'm not really not doing it as much anymore. But. I do want to investigate it, and it would be awesome to talk to her because maybe she could help me figure out. I'm sure she would. I mean, uh, she she actually blows my mind with with her knowledge and uh, the speed that she can speak at, and I I just don't know how she does it. But you'll know what I mean when you speak to her, because I'm sure it will will happen. (laughs) Yeah, I, I bought a couple of her books, and I tell you, I mean, there are, I'm, I'm, I'm smart. I'm not saying that I'm super smart, but. Holy manjoli, I could not, Some I felt like some of her concepts were so vast mm. that I could read like a paragraph or maybe a sentence and then have to stop. Yeah, that's exactly and right. just sort of like let it sink in. And, and that's exactly the way she speaks. You have to listen to each sentence. But the thing is, by, by the time you're listening to that sentence in your head, she's moved on to something else. So you're constantly right. trying to catch up with it, you know. And it's Right, right. Well, she just blows my mind, honestly. She's, she's actually... Pretty amazing, to be honest. Um, but uh, yeah, I will definitely try and uh, get that sorted for you. Um, may, that maybe awesome. that's maybe this is the reason we've been brought together to get you on there. It's possible. It's possible. <laughs> you, know, the, you never know. Because these things are um, set up, aren't they, for us? <laughs> yes, I agree. I think a lot of the stuff is connected. And one of the things I think is so amazing, which I didn't realize when I first started on this journey of writing the book and and, and getting on the podcast, is that 
every single person who has a podcast or a radio show have paranormal experiences. Yeah. The reason that they have these shows is because they have their own experiences. Yes, indeed. I mean, mine was, uh, I mean, I don't think it's uh, much in mine, but I mean, my very, uh, I mean, I don't know if you might be able to, being a medium, you might be able to tell me what this means. When I was a child about, um, well, I, was, I, I wasn't that old, probably maybe 15 months or something, or less than two years anyway. And I was at, because I was at, the reason I'm saying that is I was still in a cot with the side up at the, you know, and I was actually standing at the side of my cot, and there was a purple mist coming into the room, swirling around into the room, and it scared the, the life out of me. And my father came running in, and, and he couldn't see this mist, but it was still flying around. And then it flew, it, it was sort of swirling around, it went back out the door again. Now, obviously, at that age, I, I didn't know what ghosts were or anything like that. So, and being a, a definite purple mist, w would you have any, any explanation for that? No, but I have seen a lot of mists. So I have seen bright green mists, and I've seen um, <clears throat> what I call smoke monsters that uh, hide uh, next to the opening of my bedroom, oh. you know, the outside. I have a door that goes to the outside of the porch where my bedroom is. Right. And I don't know. I don't know what their purpose is. No. But I've seen I just wondered if the colour meant something, you know, it's, um, because being a, a young child like that, obviously you don't know anything about ghosts or, or, or spirits or anything. So, um, but I know it terrified me. And um, I asked my father about it, um, or years later, obviously, and he remembers me screaming about this uh, purple mist. <laughs> but, uh, so we, we never knew what it was. Yeah. Just well, have you asked? Uh, have you asked uh, Raven? Is her name Blue Raven? Blue, it, Blue? Solaris Blue Raven. Her name is. Yeah. Have you asked her? I think I might have mentioned it, but um, nobody seems. To, they, I get an answer kind, kind of like you did. That nobody really knows what it means. <laughs> I, I was told that purple means something about uh, because you're a child, and it's sort of, yeah, you know, it could have a meaning to do with that. But I, I really don't know. It's just one of those things. It's always stayed with me, and it. it at the time, it terrified me. Obviously, it doesn't terrify me, me now, but um, at the, right, at the right. time, it did. And it sort of stayed with well, me. I do think it's important that it terrified you because that's one of the things that I'm finding is that, especially with the different colors. Now, I had, a, a you know, as I say, that mm -hmm. white um, circle, and it was kind of like as if somebody hold, held a, um, I know it's called torch in your land, mm -hmm but a piece of white paper over a torch. So the circle didn't push out any light. It was just like this glowing white circle. And um, that terrified me. Now, why would it? Because there must be some way, maybe in my super or my unconscious or, you know, my subconscious, I know what that means. Hmm. And I bet you know what that means too. But your conscious mind doesn't but other parts of you do. Oh, I see. And yeah. they knew to be scared because that's what happened to me and it doesn't didn't make any sense to my conscious mind, but something about that meant something to me unconsciously. So maybe that's what you need to do. Maybe one of the reasons we did hook up here was because I could tell you what my experiences are and help you delve deeper into your experiences. Mm, I see what you mean. It's something um, in my spiritual self is what you're talking about, is what you're meaning, isn't it? Yes. Or just, you know, because we have a lot of different things about the mind that we don't know. Mm. and But we feel like we know, right? So we feel like, well... My, uh, I know why I don't, for instance, I, I know that I don't like, um, raw, rare or raw meat. Uh, you know, I'm a well done person. Yeah, me too. I, I uh, like, my, I, in fact, <laughs> if I have a steak, I like it burnt. Yeah, me <laughs> like too. Burnt, and I have burnt offerings. That. <laughs> I say that. I go burn it. Yeah, that's like, what, I don't want to. Yeah, burn it as much <laughs> as you like. That's right. That's what I say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I uh, am with, you know, some sauce on it afterwards to mm. help get it down. But um, why? Why is that? Now, my entire family all eats uh, rare or raw, you know, to me, bloody raw meat. Mm. Yeah. I don't want to eat that. No, I can't stand so it, yeah. It makes me wonder why. So it's not genetic. It's not my upbringing you know what i mean it what is this where did this come from well i mean we're unusual because most people do like their steaks pretty rare don't they 
Yes. You know? Yes, a lot of people do. <laughs> so that's what I think. So I think there's something there behind your conscious mind that is afraid of that, knows what that means. Yeah. Uh, uh, and maybe Raven can help you. Yeah, some kind of a sign maybe as a, as a young child to make me remember it maybe. Yeah. Or, yeah, or uh, actually... Um, you know, one of the, the tools, have you gotten to my tools in my book yet? I did have a quick, yeah, I've got, um, it's like in a, uh, um, in boxes, isn't it? That bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually that's about narcissism, but later, uh, there is a, a thing where it talks about how I found these tools to help me find out what's behind my mind. Um, so I bet you could use that. There's a tool in there called the Green Spiral Staircase. Ah, yeah, I did, use I, I did, that. Yeah, I did read that a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. I will do well, that. do that and see, find out what's behind it. Hmm. Interesting. I just hope it doesn't terrify me. <laughs> well, um, you should your mind will protect you? Actually, that's one of the things I found is that my mind will show me the important parts, but not the not the gory details, so to speak. Hmm. So it'll show you what you can handle and what you need to know, but it won't show you everything. Yeah. It's like, it will show you every detail. It's like, so, it's like you say, it's something I probably do need to know. That um, Maybe it was something else. Maybe I should have found out what it was ages ago. <laughs> probably left it a bit well, late now. Well, I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe you didn't have a, you know, an, uh, a way to express it or, uh, to a person who might be able to help you. You never know. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> true. That's true. Yeah, apart from that, I had um, a couple of UFO experiences, but um, really, that's kind of my limits. I mean, I don't consider myself psychic or anything like that, um, although I think we've all got a, a bit of that in us, as I've said before on this show. But um, obviously, most people, like yourself, for instance, are probably a lot more psychic than I am. <laughs> you know, I really think that if you um, put some a little bit of effort into it, Especially with the um, with the green spiral staircase, which I'll talk about in a minute, mm. I really think that you'll your mind will open. Or if you do some remote viewing, not too much, clearly. Mm. I mean, talk to uh, Solaris about it, but um, just a little, because what it does is it really opens your mind, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do it. I wanted to know what they were discovering. Mm. Uh, of course, I did open up a Pandora's box, but, you know, I learned so much, and I was able to write a book about it. So is it bad? Is it good? I don't know. Um, so so after I did the remote viewing, I was really upset about those remote viewers, and I um, you know, was still searching for ways around the situation. Since I'd done the healing with the uh, La Ho Chi, uh, being all in again, I bought all these books. I'd read a book about Stuart Swordlow. I don't know if you've heard of him or met him before. No, no, I don't know the name. Well, he was on the Montauk Project. Right. Now, I didn't realize this at the time that he had been abducted, too, because I read a lot of his books, but I didn't read all of his books. But one of his books that he has um, is on um, called Healing Archetypes and Symbols. And I bought that, and I bought another very large healing book that he had created with uh, tons of different healing, modal not modalities, but healing ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. So you can, um, you know, if you want some, if you want to change your, your body's age, there's a way of doing that so that, you know, your skin's tighter or whatever. <laughs> I, I did try it, but I didn't have a lot of success with it. Um, so in the meantime, I had bought those books while I was trying to fight off these ETs coming to get me every night. Um, and uh, I was not having any success. And uh, my spirit guides kept saying, you need to go back to those books by Stuart Swerdlow. And go ahead. Sorry, I'll just, I'll just write it and I'll just make a note of that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I didn't, I thought, all right, you know, I have nothing to lose. And this is why I, I went back to them, because I had tried everything else, everything. Um, and so I thought, I have nothing to lose. Now, originally when I bought them, I looked them over and I was like, uh, like, like Blue Raven Solaris, or Solaris Blue Raven, sorry mm. if I got your name wrong. <laughs> um, holy cow, these do, this is like so esoteric. I cannot even wrap my head around this. I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't see how I can apply it to my life. You know what I mean? Mm. 
So once I went back to his book, I was like, holy moly, this is exactly what I needed. And I started applying uh, some of the tools in his book, Healing Archetypes and Symbols. And um, and since I bought all of his other books, I just started reading them because I had nothing to lose. Um, I started using two symbols of his out of that book, and it's, they're in my book too. And one is called the Brown X, and it's I now Brown X out all unnecessary negativity in my life. Now, um, you want to do that because you want to Brown X out everything that is an unnecessary negativity. So um, I did try that, and I, tr- I tried it with some success. Then I read in his, one of his books called um, The Hyperspace Helper, which has, which is in my book too, um, The Green Spiral Staircase, and I realized I could use them together. Prior to that, I had read a book, uh, Communion by Whitley Strieber. Oh, yes. We all know, know that one. <laughs> right. Everyone knows that one. Well, and this is... I. Everyone who has paranormal experiences, read everyone's books. Hmm. Because we all have such completely different experiences. Even though I don't have a mist, a purple mist um, experience like David here has, I have a similar experience. So I could tell him what I think would work for him, but I don't have the exact experience he has. But it's important because when you read about their experiences, something about their experience might jump out at you and be a nugget of information that you need for your journey, for your puzzle. Mm. So one of the things I read in his book, and it's funny, I can't remember anything much more about it except for this, because this was so important to me, was that he said that the ETs do not create screen memories. You, your body, creates them. They're creating it as to protect you. So at first I thought, oh, all these dreams I'm having, they're coming from the ETs. They aren't. They're coming from you, your body, your mind. Your mind is protecting you. So if you're having a dream about how you lost your wallet or you're walking naked down the street, everybody's looking at you and you can't find some clothes Mm -hmm. or whatever, whatever you find stressful. You lost your car, you're at the airport and you can't uh, find your luggage and you can't remember where it is. Those are all stress dreams. And your body and your mind is saying to you, this is, you are having stress. Now, the ETs wipe your memory. And so it's kind of a frustration. So what I did was I realized that if I used the green spiral staircase, I was literally doing a remote view of my own mind. And I could look behind the dream. And when I looked behind the dream, I could find out what it's really all about. Now, that's key. Because once you do that, now you've taken away their power. And now you know what happened before they did the memory wipe. Yes. So anytime you need to see what's behind something, a dream, or let's say you have anxiety, or I had claustrophobia. So what I would do is I would follow the instructions in my book, which is, uh, putting myself in a um, medium green all around my body, putting my um, third eye in a royal blue. I would imagine a green spiral staircase in front of me, and I would walk down the staircase. And at some point, I would feel the need to step off. When I step off, I walk towards the big blank screen that's in front of me, and I see what's behind the dream. Oh, I have the dream in my mind as I'm walking down the staircase. Sorry, I forgot that. Um, So then you see what you're going to see. Your mind shows you the important parts. There's a color called uh, pale orange that you can put over the scene to see if it's real or if it's fake. Sometimes things are distorted, and if it changes color, it is not true. Um, Then you can use your brown X. That's where you use it. Anything in this scene which is is unnecessary negativity, which I consider all of it because who knows, I I want to get rid of all of that stuff. Brown X, brown X, brown X, brown X. And you can either say it or you can use the symbol. It's a medium brown X. And I recommend you do get Stuart Swerdlow's Healing Archetypes and Symbols book Mm. um, so that you can see the visual. But you can also use the words and you brown X everything out. 
and then you walk back to the staircase, back up it, and then you put your entire body in brown. And then you do that for every single dream or weird experience you have. Um, I started using it for claustrophobia for me, and um, I really had a huge success. I used At 40, I suddenly turned claustrophobic, and I couldn't figure out why. So I used the green spiral staircase, and I looked behind it, and I drilled down, basically. So I said, why am I claustrophobic? The screen comes up. It shows me that I was fear, having fear, and then and then panic. And then dr- what's behind that? Oh, uh, behind that is um, not being able to breathe. And what's behind that? Oh, it's a it's a um, coffin, a black coffin. So. Now that I did that and I brown X'd all of that out, now I found that I can go, um, you know, in places and put be in small spaces and not freak out because I'm not claustrophobic anymore. Wow. Uh, another radio show guy tried it. He said he was feeling anxious, and he he did the green spiral staircase to find out what was behind his anxiety, and he found that it was a green peaceful field. He felt peace. And he was able to sleep. So whatever is behind all of your experiences might not be the same as mine. And that's okay because we're not all the same. Um, But try these things because you can use it for anxiety, you know, all of the things. If you're not being abducted by aliens, if you just want to know what's behind your dreams, um, what's behind uh, anything that's happening to you, use the green spiral staircase. It will help you. Mm, It's like a a self-hypnosis, really, isn't it? Oh. Yes, it is. It is like self-hypnosis. And it's better because I think what's happening with the ETs, I really, and this is why I don't do hypnotic regression, is because I think the ETs are using some sort of self-hypnosis too. Because uh, there was, I th- this is in my book, but I remember waking up and trying to figure out, um, I have a clock that projects the numbers on my of the time on my ceiling and I was remember saying to myself, don't move until 331, don't move until 331. And I thought it was sort of like a geofence of 331. Now, I didn't know what 331 was, but the time was 330. So I thought, well, I'm not laying here and until 331. I'm going to get up. I have to go to the restroom. So I got up. I, you know, walked like a drunken sailor all the way there. And I finally realized this is... This was some sort of hypnotic suggestion that I should not move until 331. So I really think that that's one of the things they're doing. And it may not be that they're wiping our memory at all. They might be saying, you will, at, when you come out of this or when we leave here or at whatever time, you will only remember a re- black rectangle, hmm. for instance. You will rem- when you remember this, you will only see people that their faces will be blurred or something like that to make sure that we cannot remember the important parts. So take away their power, Break, pull in your power, use these tools, find out what's really going on with you behind the scenes. Hmm. Do you feel that uh, this is the same tool that hypnotists use when they talk to you know a subject? Uh, are they getting to the same place that you're getting to on your own, do you think? I don't know. It's a good question. I mean, I have been hypnotized before, and apparently I'm a good subject. So um, I don't know. I just think that the important thing is that right now it feels like the ETs have control, but you can take that back. And that's one of my things is that, you know, I felt very helpless and very fearful that somebody else had control of my body mm. and I didn't know about it. <clears throat> and so I wanted to feel better. And so through trial and error, I found that I could use this and I could use every single thing I knew prior to being abducted and also and every single thing I knew after being abducted. And I could slowly piece everything together. Sure. And that's what's been happening. And so, yeah, you know, the smelly clothes thing is a is um, seems unimportant, but it's actually a clue. Mm. So you would know if you were actually leaving your house, if you started smelling your clothes before you went to bed. And then if you smelled them the next day and they smelled funny, you would know that you left. 
Um, I noticed that I had certain times I would have uh, low-flying planes or helicopters over my house, and of course it's the middle of the night, and so I'm not going to get up and try to take a fic- picture of a, something that's black, you know, <laughs> in the middle of the night. Um, so I just wrote down everything, and that's one of the things uh, in my in my book has my journal, and I. At first, I didn't want to put it in, but my spirit guides insisted that I do that. And um, so I do. I did it, but it really serves as a really important kind of milestone because now when I've written everything down, I can go back and say now and read it because occasionally I have to read my own book so that I remember where I was when I wrote the book, which is not where I am now. Well, I, yeah. I can say... I can say to myself, oh, oh my gosh, I know what that means now. I know what that means now. I mean, there are so many things that I know what it means now, which I didn't at the time. Mm. And so it's really, really important to have a record. So write everything down, whether it's important or not. Make sure you take pictures. I didn't take a lot of pictures um, because I didn't know I'd write a book. I never thought in a million years I'd write a book and tell everyone this because it's kind of a hard thing to admit to people. But I did uh, take some photos. Some of them were really strange and um, and unusual because there were periods of time where I would feel a little, uh, feel like a mosquito biting me, and I call them sleep darts now. A sleep dart would hit me, and I would fall asleep immediately. Um, now, I used to fight them, and I would also try to stay as awake as long as possible. I stayed up all night, but I'm not 20 anymore, and I can't stay up all night and be <laughs> functional the next day. <laughs> yeah. I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I, did, I did try to find out who was doing it. I put up some nanny cam picture frames. You know, it's a fake picture frame that is uh, basically has a fake photo in it, and you uh, it's motion detected motion sensor so i'd put that on and i'd turn it on everything was fine i'd go to bed the next day it would be in between on and off it wouldn't be on and it wouldn't be off so i just um you know i tried all the things i just couldn't get it to work but this works so now i used to be uh, abducted four times a night and now i'm abducted once a night so i'm still fighting the good fight i'm figuring it all out what's going on and I'm still um, getting, you know, getting more and more information. But we're all different. Unfortunately, we all have to do our work. Um, I can't, I can try to help you, you know, uh, with what, you know, to point you in the right direction. But unfortunately, you know, a lot of people don't want to know what's happening. Sure, they're yeah. don't, they're too scared. And um, and that's fine. That's up to you. But I wanted to know what was happening, and I wanted it to stop. And that's my goal. My goal is to get it to stop. But once I found these, I thought, well, I can't hold on. I can't keep these to myself. I have to tell people. But oh my gosh, it is so hard to find people who will admit to being abducted by aliens, but also being admit, you know, will even talk to you about sure, it. Sure. Yeah. And. <clears throat> Well, I'd like to throw another name at you. Um, have you spoken to Kathleen Martin at all? No. Because, what podcast is she on? Well, no, she's been, she's been doing a lot in um, abductions and everything. She, she's actually the uh, niece of the um, Betty and Barney Hill abduction. Oh, wow. But she's actually, well, she's been on this show a couple of times, and um, she deals with a lot in abductions, and uh, I think she's been doing like hypnosis and stuff like that. So... If I may, I'd like to put you in touch with her, <laughs> too. Cause, that would be because awesome. Because I'm sure you'd, uh, you'd have a lot to talk about, you know. I'm sure I would. Yeah, ca- um, Kathleen Martin. Do you, know any, that, do you know anyone named David Jacobs? David Jacobs. Dr. David Jacobs. I know the name. Uh, I don't know. I've never spoken to him. But, uh, yes, I do know the name. Uh, yeah, I tried to get in touch with him, that poor guy. I mean, I feel bad for him because I think they're... I, I sent my book and both of the books to uh, the Stuart Swordlow books to him, but I never heard anything. But I just felt bad that he was just so depressed and yeah. felt like it was such a negative thing. And it is. Mm. It is negative. Yeah, absolutely. And um, that's another problem. We have the contactees and we have the experiencers. So, um, and I actually consider myself abductee, not 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 either of those. 
because I am being taken against my will. Sure. And I have said no multiple times and it doesn't matter. So I don't feel happy or um, excited that I'm being taken. Yeah. Is, it, and is it always in a physical sense or is it sometimes like a spiritual sense of uh, abduction, if you see what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I think it is both, actually. And I don't know, I haven't figured out which it is. Um, you know, the fact that I actually wear clothes, uh, you know, leads you to the fa- effect, a feeling of you are, are actually leaving. But who knows? Maybe that's a prop, you know? Yeah, yeah. That, uh, I mean, that they want you to believe that. And so, therefore, they make sure your clothes smell so you can find you know, these clues that make you, you know, lead you in a certain direction. Maybe it's really misdirection or disinformation or something. I don't know. I mean, that's one of the problems. I wish more people would either write books about this or um, write to me after you've tried these um, tools. They're not mine. They're uh, Stuart Swerdlow's. But use them. Tell us what happens because, you know, I am one person telling my story mm. and all I have is my experiences, which I have tried to figure out what's going on for me. Now, I'm not saying it's not going on for you, but if it is, we could we could compare notes. We could really get a movement together. But right now I'm like one lone voice trying to get everyone to try it. Just try it. And see what they find out. So I really am interested in knowing what you find out with your purple myth. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> I mean, there's almost because it's really important. There could well be people gonna, you know, listening to this show out there that may be thinking themselves, you know, the, the, the same things that uh, they think they're the only ones out there, think, you know, suffering this, and uh, they're, they're not, obviously. Uh, and let's hope they list, they learn from this. Uh, they may well be writing their own book later. But, uh, I mean, obviously, if, if anyone wants to get in touch with me about this, then I can put you in touch with Lisa. Um, <laughs> you know, anyone listening to this <laughs> that uh, has, has had some amazing experiences, uh, you might like to speak to Lisa about it. Absolutely. Yeah, you, you mentioned a lot about um, rocks and crystals. Um, do you feel they do have an effect on what... Um, uh, do they help you in <laughs> in any way? I actually do feel like they help me. And especially initially, I would um, use them for all kinds of things. I actually got uh, some crystal skulls, and it's interesting. So sometimes I'll get information, and I don't know where it comes from, and it really does work, so I don't try to figure out who it is telling me this stuff. But Hmm. um, one of the things I found out was that uh, crystal skulls, or actually any skulls, on top, like my, my computer monitor is on a stand, and so I found that I would sometimes have a great idea for my book only to come uh, to, to my screen and I'm blank out. So um, yeah. I was told, I think, by my spirit guides that um, get some skulls, uh, crystal if you can, but, you know, those can be very expensive. Maybe you should get geodes or different ones and put them on your monitor stand. And, oh, my gosh, it makes a huge difference. It's sort of like sucking out all the negativity that's trying to block you from your near your mind from putting it down on your computer i told a friend of mine about it she said that she would get headaches every time she was staring at her computer you know she had to do that for a job and she got a um skull she put it there all of her headaches went away (laughs) and she didn't buy a pair of glasses as well Yeah, she was wearing her glasses, and she just said she just couldn't stand stand, sitting there for more than 10 minutes. Mm. And, you know, she had she was like one of those traveling nurses kind of thing where she had to visit her patients and, you know, spend a lot of time on the computer. So, I mean, the thing is, is that try it. If it works for you, you have nothing to lose. And the um, and the geode, geode skulls are fairly inexpensive. I don't know, like, let's say... $30 $30 or something like that in USD, but um, what, what have you got to lose except for $30? Yeah. Um, or or yeah, around about 20 pounds or so over here, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know how much that is. But probably a little bit more than 20 pounds over here, probably. <laughs> okay. 
All right. Well, I mean, find some inexpensive ones. Find the ones that call to you. Uh. So one of the things that happens to me is I'll be uh, looking for certain rocks. I'll just feel pulled towards a certain rock. And, you know, hopefully they have rock shops in England. Oh, yeah. They yeah, do. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, walk around. Find out what uh, pulls you, what draws you. Um, because I think that is an important aspect of this. I mean, we talked about people being drawn to us. Why not rock? Yeah. Um, and so utilize those. Find out what, what works best for you. I had a crystal skull that I was got from some other guy who had it for a while. And a uh, used skull, if you will. But anyway, I used it to uh, for healing. Um, one of the things I would use is I uh, have a, a copper pyramid that I um, built. And the instructions to, for building your own copper pyramid are in my book. Yep, I'll see And that. it's actually, <laughs> it's actually um, copper pipes with speaker wire so that you can have the bottom and a split ring. You know, those rings, that, I don't know if you, you have these in England, but you put them to have your keys. You break your oh, yeah. fingernail yeah, yeah. trying yeah. to open oh, them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah, plenty of, plenty of split fingernails. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Um, get a large one and just, you know, and then you have to be able to put some holes, drill some holes in the tops of the pipes and put the speaker wire in. And wow, I mean, the copper pyramid, I don't know if you've read much about pyramids, but they are, yeah, they're amazing healing tools. Yes, I've heard a lot. Uh, I mean, it's something I can't quite get my head around, but, um, yeah, no, I, I agree. I've heard a lot about it. Um, yeah. I don't know who, if anyone can explain it, but, uh, <laughs> It's it, yeah. it certainly seems to work anyway, from what I gather. Well, one of the things I found was that when I would do uh, meditation, I would um, use it, and it was a little like meditation funnel. I mean, if you will, because it was directing uh, information right to my head. So um, I, I highly recommend that. Um, I also would put selenite around the inside of the of my. Um, pyramid to you know clear out whatever negativity was in there um yeah i bought a lot of stones and um yeah i just felt like whatever drew me i i would use different stones for different things you know for grounding and everyone who owns a rock shop usually are into rocks so Mm. ask them ask them what is this used for can i use this for in my healing practice i mean once you get uh, involved in this whole um rock thing you're going to be sucked in pretty quickly mm, yeah but you can have you can have all kinds of um i think call, they call grids or you have a grid a rock grid under your bed and uh yeah there's it's uh pretty amazing all the things you can do we have got a quartz with crystal to, which stands up it's like a pointed uh, obelisk type of thing and it's supposed to um, bring good luck to the home um and keep out evil spirits so i understand but uh whether that's true or not, I don't know. Well, uh, hopefully you you haven't had been visited by that purple mist, have no, you? No, I haven't. <laughs> it's supposed, well, there you it's go. supposed to be and good vibrations. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, one of the things I also use are the um, Tibetan singing bowls, and I got those mm. on Amazon. And those are really cool because uh, I have a aversion to smells, really some big, awful smells, but... So uh, sometimes they'll have <laughs> sage, you know, yeah. like sage, and they'll mm, sage a room, yeah. and I just cannot take it because it's just too smelly. And I also have asthma, so I don't want to be breathing any of that in. No. But this is so awesome. So if you walk into a room, and I'm sure everyone is, who's on or listening to this paranormal show has had this issue, you walk into a uh, room, and it feels wrong. It feels bad. Yeah. It feels, you suddenly feel like, I gotta get out of here. Yeah. And you don't even know why. No, we've all had that experience, yeah. haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> right. Everyone's at it. I mean, I was at this gas station once in California and I had this vision of like, um, like tribal people beating a drum and oh man, it was just horrible. It was a horrible feeling. I never went back to that gas station again. Um, cause there was just some negative energy there. And so, yeah, I use that. Um, I found a lot of um, yahoos come to me in the shower, whether being bad spirits or, <coughs> excuse me, um, some just negative energy. And so I use um, 
I use those bowls. But one of the things I found that really, really works is Yahweh. Now, I'm not a religious person. I hope I don't offend anyone. I'm not either. By using this word. <laughs> but we are sp- but um, we are spiritual beings. That's the way I look at it. Yes, yes. So um, so apparently that really really works. Oh my gosh, I use that e- now too. Anytime I feel any negativity in the room, just saying the word Yahweh clears everything. Well, I'm scribbling it down. Yeah, so it's in my book. Yep. That's one of the tools. So definitely. Um, Use Yahweh. I mean, anytime you feel menaced or in a in a bad area, or if there's something in your car, um, definitely use Yahweh. And um, you know, because you never know what's really there. The problem is we can't see it. Sure. And you could see that purple mist. Your dad couldn't. Yeah. Well, I just thought that was uh, later on. I just thought it was something that children can see, but adults can't. Um, it's probably the case. Yeah. I mean, when you when you talk but, about a, a greys, for instance, uh, the, uh, the greys that have abducted you, are they working with other aliens or are they working on their own? I believe that they are um, like minions of some other mm. race. Because I do I do um, understand from some people that they actually work under the reptilians, for instance. Right, right. Um, well, you know, it's funny now, somebody else asked me on another show, and I thought this was an interesting question. They said, why couldn't, first of all, how could you never feel that negativity before? And I think it's because I'd been uh, raising my vibration by meditating the whole time prior to that. Then I could finally feel it. Then I could ask my spirit guides about it, and then I could find out the truth. You know what I mean? But before, I couldn't feel it. Yeah. And so I think that's really, really important. Um, but also, yeah, I've seen reptilians. I've seen spiders. Um, the, mo- the two most amazing things I saw, which I never expected, and I didn't see the greys. I could only feel them. Ah. I felt their, ne- their negativity. That was my next question. That was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take that one off. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't see them. And, you know, it was funny, too, when I when they told me, oh, yeah, you don't, they stole all your eggs. You don't have children. And this is the reason is because of that. I I suddenly, you know, stopped for a moment in time and thought, oh, my gosh, that makes sense because I didn't have the ticking clock. I didn't have, you know, here I am in my 30s. Uh, I think back to my 30s where I was having a lot of weird problems where I would be find myself sleepwalking and running down the hall. Um, I would find myself crouched and staring into my closet like as if I was talking to someone there. And also I didn't have, you know, any of these fertility things that happen to normal people Mm. uh, in my 30s. And so uh, it sort of like made everything kind of fall into place to know that, you know, like that was the one piece of information I needed to know in order to understand what was really happening there. Yeah. Um, but when I did see some uh, ETs, uh, I had been asking to see them because my um, medium was all about how everything felt. Did you feel it? Was it good? Was it bad? You know, um, and at the time, I really felt that feeling wasn't as important as seeing. So I asked to see it. So I tried to see it and I begged to see it and I could never see it. So one of the things that happened was I went to a intuitive um, acupuncturist and he stuck his needles in and he um, then that night I um, saw and felt a negative presence and it was a praying mantis. Ah, right. Now, I've heard that um, quite a few times. Have you? Mm. What have you heard about it? Well, I mean, that people come across this prey mantis type of alien or, or being. That they're quite a terrifying being. That's really all I've heard about it. They are terrifying. Actually, the one I saw, well, I saw two of them. And um, the first one was <clears throat> seemingly male, mm-hmm. but basically strode into my room and then smacked me with either a spoon or a tuning fork on my lady private parts which hurt mm-hmm. 
and then I fell asleep, and then he pointed at me, and then I fell asleep. Oh. So that was a quick encounter. I had another encounter where I fi- re- finally realized that I had some sort of implants. Was that I was walk, or, you know, gotten cut. We have these tall garbage bins and tall recycle bins here in Arizona, and I one had fallen on me, <clears throat> and it cut the top of my leg near the knee, and. One night I was laying in bed, and all of a sudden my leg started throbbing, and it hadn't throbbed before. You know, everything throbs the first time you cut it, but Mm. after a while it shouldn't continue to throb. So I was laying there minding my own business, trying to go to sleep, and the my leg started throbbing. And it throbbed and throbbed, and then I looked up, and there was a praying mantis next to my bed. And um, she was... Like, she she seemed like a woman, and people have asked me why. Well, she told me her name was Moma, M-O-M-A, and she said she was, um, come, she was wanted to take me to the ship to fix my leg. <laughs> and I, there was no way I was going to say yes to that, because why would I, I mean, my my medium was telling me that it was my fault that I had agreed to go on ships with the, uh, soul contracts and I sure as heck didn't want to say oh yeah go ahead take me on your <laughs> ship so I said no you cannot take me you can't take me on my ship on your ship I don't want to go I'm going to say no so then um, she said well what if someone else takes you and then I'd get you from them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I think I said yes to that because you know it was already too late but Anyway, um, she was just extremely tall, like about seven foot tall. I'm 5'10", so I feel like I can judge height. <clears throat> I was laying down, and it was just one of those things where you think to yourself, oh, my gosh, I have cannot imagine. I mean, of all the things I expected to see, it wasn't to see a praying mantis. And I wasn't frozen or wasn't paralyzed. Uh, I just was so fascinated. I just mm. could not even move. Um, have you ever seen anything like that? No, I haven't. I don't think I want to. But uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. But I've heard that term, the the the, the praying mantis type alien, uh, several times actually. So n- now you saying it again sort of sends a bit of a shiver down my spine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was pretty strange. But the next day I woke up, my leg didn't hurt, and um, and I thought they they took me the they got rid of the implant, and I have implants, and I didn't even know that I had an implant there. I mean, sometimes I found um, other things like um, this is not in the book. So I was on vacation. I was in a hotel room, and I had this. Um, I noticed I had this ingrown hair on my thigh. And um, I, uh, you know, got rid of the ingrown hair. Well, there was a hole underneath it. And I was just like, what the heck? Well, it felt like there was a flesh marble in there, so I eventually got it out. And I didn't have a knife, or else I would have cut it in half, you know, because I was not at home. But, um, yeah, it eventually just disintegrated. It just died as as if it could only be alive while it was inside my skin. It was really strange. Wow. And um, <clears throat> that's the uh, main one I found. Um, the rest, you know, you'll feel things under your skin, but you don't know unless you get a scalpel and start digging things out. Mm. There's just no way to know what you're really, you know, what that stuff really is. Mm, indeed. One of the things, I was on the Tracy Austin show, mm. and she mm. was saying to me, um, which I didn't realize that, she said, what about your husband? Doesn't he ever wake up? And I said, no, he doesn't. He falls asleep as soon as his head hits the pillow. He is totally out. And she said, you know what? Um, that is so common. And I didn't know that. And I felt bad that I couldn't explain why my husband didn't wake up. Mm. You know, if this, these things are happening to me. But she said that's common. They make sure that the husband doesn't wake up right. when they take the woman, right? Because the woman is like an incubator, <laughs> you know, for whatever things that they're doing. Yeah, sure. And so it doesn't behoove them for for the man to wake up, right? So, because I could never understand that either. I mean, he is, he is in, in some ways a very light sleeper, but at the same time, 
here are these things happening to me, and he doesn't, he, he's out like a light. Hmm. You know, I, so, I uh, sometimes wonder if things are happening to me, you know, because, um, uh, my wife tells me that some some nights I'm really restless and I'm kicking the sheets and covers all over the place. I don't know. I've got no recollection of it at all. So, and I, you know, in the morning I can't. She says, "Oh, you were really, you had a really bad night last night. I was kicking the covers all over, and um, it makes me wonder what's going on, because I, I have no, yeah. I have no memories of any bad dreams or anything. So, yeah. See now, uh, but what dreams do you have? Well, I don't. I, I can never. I can hardly ever remember any dreams. You know, it's um, one that one that has stuck in my mind from many years ago. Um, funny thing was, I, I woke up from a, a dream in a start, and I can remember the last words were, were, were like a, a man laughing, and he said, "It's the vibrations." Uh, as if someone was actually telling me it's all about vibrations in the yeah you know, the world's all made up of vibrations <laughs> you know mm-hmm. um, and that kind of stuck with me that did um, it's only when I started thinking about that I think well, I, was that somebody telling me that everything's all about vibrations you know it's uh, it probably means nothing to you what, <laughs> but to me no it actually <laughs> does it does mean something to me and I think that. Um, you know, I think you can take some of these things at face value, but then also look at behind them yeah. and see if there's anything behind there. Because, uh, yeah, a lot of my dreams I take at face value because some of them are just, they feel different than the other dreams, yeah. you know. It was somebody laughing at me like, ha, 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 it's in the vibrations, you know, that type of thing. Right. <laughs> and that's when I suddenly woke up. And, um, you know, it, it felt as if someone was telling me something somewhere else, if you see what I mean. And then, yeah, and then, yeah, I, then I was suddenly do. straight back into my body again. It's um, right. It's one of those things I've, right. I've not really sort of mentioned it to much to anyone else. But um, I thought while we were talking about right. this type of thing, it sort of it seemed fitting. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I, I agree, and I think that's part of the problem is that we don't know what's the truth. You know, when we get a dream that seems more true than others. Yeah. There's only one way to find out, and that's from my perspective, is use that tool, the green spiral staircase, to look behind it. Is there anything behind it? And maybe that's part of a puzzle piece that you need for your life. I'm going to do that, Um, actually. Well, um, also, you know, there are a couple of apps that I talk about in the the book, but one's called uh, Meditation Oasis. And it's an app on Facebook, mm-hmm. or not Facebook, sorry. It's an app on um, Apple, and I think it's on both stores. I don't know if it's just on the Apple store. But, um, yeah, that one is guided. And that's one of the things that I found that I really needed because I cannot meditate by just sitting there because my mind wanders, and you know what I mean? And you don't even realize your mind's wandering until mm. it's too late. But um, I actually started listening to guided meditation, and they have all kinds of different ones and um, and lengths. Because sometimes you just want 10 minutes to clear your mind. Sure. You know, you don't want to go through a half an hour or an hour. So there's tons of uh, short little meditations, and find the ones you like. There's some on YouTube, um, you know. There is a lot of different meditations Um that you can choose from and just try the ones you like you know don't don't listen to me find one that you like oh well no, <laughs> you know? well, no I think it's important to be listening to you you've you come out with a lot of, lot of <laughs> gems actually <laughs> well, I think certainly but, yeah. I think certainly I'd advise to get your book which is available on Amazon isn't it yeah there was a little bit there it, was a little bit of a problem about Amazon in the UK did you sort that out well, what happened is, um, so that everyone knows, uh, it's okay, it's available in the UK, it's available everywhere, um, but as an author, um, I could not gift a book, I, a US Kindle version ebook, I could not gift it to David uh, in the UK. Now, what I finally, um, actually, it went through quite a bit of back and forth with... Um, Amazon, but one thing I did, because this is who I am, sorry, (laughs) is uh, I actually contacted Jeff Bezos, because this is an important thing. I should be able to, you know, get on any show that I want in any country Mm -hmm. and be able to gift my ebook to that author, to that podcast or radio show without a problem. So they came up with a bunch of Band-Aid solutions, and when I contacted support, they kept saying, well, this is a feature. 
Well, I was in IT support for a long time, and I know when people use the word feature, they mean this is a problem we can't solve, so we've come up with a workaround. Right. So I did contact Jeff Bezos. He did send me some other guy <clears throat> named Tony who wanted me to go through the support tree at Amazon, which is uh, through Kindle. So um, I did it. I did it a couple of times. I found out they have some issues with some of their support people. And then I realized that this is a policy. And so they probably knew the whole time that they could not solve. I could not get this solved yeah. by going through their support tree. So I sent them another email saying, this is unacceptable. I really want this policy changed. This is a policy, you know. (laughs) And I sent that two weeks ago, and I'm going to wait until next Friday, which will be three weeks. And then I'm going to contact them again because that is ridiculous. They are sending, I'm sending a file Mm. that I've purchased, you know, myself and sent you the file to be gifted to your Kindle yeah, in the UK. That doesn't make sense. Well, it's crazy because with Amazon's Amazon, isn't it? And you think, oh, well, just because right. it's the US and the UK, what's, what's, you know, why can't they just send the file? It's ridiculous. <laughs> well, one thing they were trying to tell me was it was because your Kindle was registered in the UK and that files coming from the US cannot could be registered to a UK oh, Kindle. Yeah, why would, why but, would that be? I mean, we can get DVDs and <laughs> all sorts of other... <laughs> exactly. So I actually had one of the guys... Uh, so, so, so help me understand this. If I wanted to gift him a physical book, because first they were trying to say, oh, well, it's the ISBN or ASIN number. And I would say, okay... So if I were trying to gift him a physical book and I was sending it from the U.S. to the U.K., would that work? Yes, but not an e-book. I said, does that make sense? This is a file going to a product of yours. And so so they're really quiet now. (laughs) I'm going to have to stir the pot a little bit more, but it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't, does it? uh, It it should... it's uh you know a problem. I mean you can buy it and uh but you can buy it on your end. Everyone in the oh, UK yeah, can yeah. buy this book in the UK. But me as the author cannot gift that no. book to anyone in the UK. No, very, you very fine you right? very kindly sent me the PDF version of it anyway, but I am actually going to buy it Lisa because I think it's um it's it's a book I want on my shelf so. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you do um, you know, let me, did I send you my photos? Cause I have quite a few photos, uh, of some of the pictures. The Kindle version has better pictures cause I used an iPhone originally to take the photos right. and they don't come out so well in the yeah, print no, book. No, so. I haven't got that many photos. I must say there's a couple of black and white ones in it, but, um, yeah, yeah. But, uh, so I can send you some photos. Oh, well, I mean, you I've know what? The, I'll send you the, see, the, the thing is, I will actually put that on the Paranormal Dimensions page anyway. You know, to um, I'll put as much information as I can about getting your book on the on the page. So. Okay. Well, I'll send you those photos because I have them separated out, and then you could post them on your um, website right. if you yeah, want. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, please. <laughs> and their color, and uh, but you know they just didn't come out well, I guess, in the print version. Mm. I don't know why. Yeah, but I'll definitely be buying it, and I would would advise anyone else listening to this show uh, to get it too, because it's uh, it's very, very interesting, and it's uh, it's, it's very detailed about what happened to you in your life. I know that. Um, Even though I haven't read the whole thing, the whole book yet, but uh, what I have read, it's actually fascinating. Have you got a website of your own? Yes, I do. I have um, LisaOHaraOnline.com. I have a Facebook group, Abducted and Furious, um, is one of my Facebook groups. I can send you that link. Oh, yes. Yes, please. Yep. Um, and then um, Abducted and Furious, the page. So I'll send you all those links. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'll put those out. And um, then um, you could also reach me at abductedandfurious at yahoo.com if you want to send me an email. And uh, I'm on Amazon right now exclusively. Um, I think all new authors, I think, need to start somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, there's a learning curve. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, um, you may well be getting some emails from people that are having problems of their own, and uh, they might want some advice from you. Yeah, that would be fine. I would really appreciate it because 
I think that there's just not a lot of people willing to give advice uh, about what they think. But the problem is, is that, and I think this is by design, mm. is that all of our stories are completely different. I mean, you have a, pink, a purple mist, mm. and I've seen a green mist, but are they similar? I mean, yeah, this is, um, and how would they come up in conversation? You yeah, know? that's right. I mean, unless you, I mean, what age did you see the green mist? Let's see, probably. A young child type of... Um, no. No, I, I, as a young child, I would have really, really scary dreams that seemed almost uh, like CG. <laughs> <laughs> um, but and that was at age nine. But um, at... Uh, uh, see, it was 2009, so I'm going to say that I was um, 48, 47 right. when I saw the green mist. And... Um, I also had a couple of really, really strange dreams. Um, actually, these were weird. They were like lucid dreams. But I remember that specifically because they were, uh, my husband uses a, a um, software called Quicken to do our um, financial stuff. I, I remember that. Really it's been around for a long time, hasn't it? <laughs> All right. Yeah, yeah. So at that time, it was completely mind-boggling to me. I could not understand. Yeah. It was so busy. It was sort of like seeing Word for the first time where yeah. like, I have all these drop downs and I have these things that I can right mouse click on and then I can also have keystrokes and it's just, it's just kind of too much for the brain. Mm-hmm. So he was doing all of our finances that way and um, I had a dream that he had died and that I hadn't learned Quicken. And that scared me so much. Um, so I, I tried, you know, I started learning Quicken right away because that was such a weird surreal dream. Mm-hmm. So, but then it sort of wears off. You know how <laughs> your dreams kind of wear off a little. So then six months late, because I, so I learned it, but it was still, you know, it's complicated pro- system. Yeah, so geez. then it, some time drives by, and so all of a sudden, so then I had a second dream, and I said, it was, we warned you before about learning quick, and then you didn't listen to us. <laughs> and Bob has died, and oh my gosh, oh, after gosh. that, I really did learn. So that was an important time. So I don't know if that was just preparing me for what was going to happen later. I don't know, but mm. that's why it's hard to know. You know, that's my experience is sometimes I have dreams. Now, that didn't come true, but I have since learned that I'm glad I did learn Quicken because um, the ETs, one of the things I really like to do, and I really think this is one of the worst, worst traits, is first of all, they feed off of our fear, mm. but secondly... They um, like to use emotional blackmail because they know we will do what we they say if we they use it. So one of the things they would do, my husband recently had uh, back surgery, and they said, um, you know, when Bob has that surgery next tomorrow, we're going to kill him. And I said, okay, I'm ready because I don't want them to have emotional blackmail power over mm. me. And I had already told Bob, and this is in the book, that I didn't, um, you know, wanted him to say, if they say to you, if you don't do this, we're going to kill Lisa, make sure you say, okay, that's her journey. Because that's what I'm going to say. Because otherwise they have complete control over us and they can get us to do anything. And this is why I think they have people's children's. They have them because they want to be able to say, if you don't do this, we're going to harm your child. Mm-hmm. And so that way they can, and and then they can enjoy also the fear and terror and panic and anxiety produced by that. So it's really important. The more you actually look at all the stuff actually going on behind the scenes, what happens is you become less and less fearful. And in fact, um, now I'm not afraid at all of anything. I've seen some, you know, uh, smoke mo- more smoke monsters. I've had things moved around in my house, and I'm not afraid of anything anymore because that's what they want. They want my fear, and I feel like the less. And I wonder too if also using the tools and, be- and desensitizing myself to all of that stuff is taking away all that fear because now I've seen so many things. Now they're leaving me alone because it's not as much fun. Huh. They don't get as much out of it. Do you have a feeling as to why they picked on you in the first place? Um, Do you think they actually... I mean, is it a thing... I know you said about this um, contract that... um, Do you you feel that this was your purpose on this planet 
to be to be um, abducted by these aliens? <laughs> Uh, no, I don't. Um, but I do think that that is a convenient excuse. Now, in my book, I have a tree of um, or like a little box of narcissistic traits That's, in yeah. people and and actually narcissistic traits in um, ETs. Now, I think that is kind of like a thing where they're saying, no, you brought this on yourself. I didn't do this to you. You chose this. Mm. To me, it seems like it's a narcissistic rule of blaming the victim, truthfully. And so I don't believe that that is even true at all. I think there are a lot of things that we're told, like, for instance, go to the light is one of them. Now, um, I really think that that's been brought home in movies and everything, that that's what you need to do. And, um, you know, I, I don't believe that. I think there, either there are two, uh, lights, one a, a good one and one an ET one, or there's actually, um, the say, you need to say, I want to go home. Because if you say, I want to go home, that takes away their power of sending you to the light. And I think you get recycled, you get reincarnated mm-hmm. and sent back here. I think it's a trap. Um, so I think everything they do is like a narcissist. They have their agenda and they're trying to make you feel like you're responsible for your choices and you are the reason that you're here. It's not anything they're doing. They're not at fault. It's you. <laughs> so I really don't believe any of that anymore. Um, I think that it's their they have their own agenda we don't know what it is and uh, it's key, it helps them to keep us in the dark to either wipe our memory or uh, you know blur our memory in some way and then they can say no no you don't understand this is all because of your choice mm. you chose this so I think it's just some sort of blame game where they make us feel responsible. Mm. I was reading an article recently about um, narcissists, and it said one of the things that there are two ways they hook you. One is by fear and anxiety, and the second one is guilt and responsibility. And that's so true. So if anyone's conversing with you, and the first thing they do is try to guilt you and make you feel responsible, you know they're a narcissist. So avoid them. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, when you're talking about that... So- uh, my my wife had a, a near death experience way before I knew her. Uh, she my my wife's got um, asthma too, and she actually died twice on the way to the hospital. Um, this is this is before I knew her, she, but she told me about it a couple of times. Um, and she was was taken to she she saw the light and she went to the light and she was given the choice as to whether to come back or not. Um, and and wow. she chose to come back because she was uh, she had unfinished business. I think the unfinished business was to meet me, but uh, <laughs> but that, that was a quite a, a few years on sort of thing. But um, but uh, but she feels she had that choice, and so she's got no fear of death now. I mean, she knows that there's something there at the end of it. So so yeah. now whether who gave her that choice, we don't know because she couldn't actually see any beings or anything. All she could see was this bright light and this um, really enveloping sort of love uh, feeling, you know. But uh, she chose to come back. So, so did she? I mean, so what else did she remember of it? Did she feel? So she felt a lot of love. Yeah. And she felt. And she did she hear it outside of her head or inside of her head? I mean, where did she hear her voice? Well, the well, voice. She said that she she was drawn to this light, and from what she's described, um, it was really all. Well, she she said she definitely died because actually the the actual ambulance drivers actually came in and told her but that uh, they'd actually put the pedals on her chest twice. <laughs> this was a wow, you know, and they, and she did actually, um, you know, they, they actually her heart had stopped and uh, I mean there is an argument that a lot of things go on in your brain and everything, isn't there? Um, yeah. But, there are other arguments that um, you you experience things that you couldn't have known about. Um, That's true. Which are, which are acting outside of your brain, you know. So, but she's convinced in herself that um, she was given that choice and she decided to come back. So. Wow, how cool. I've never met anyone with yeah. that, but that's awesome. Yeah. Well, I hadn't until that, you know, and it's... um. Um, she she's quite peaceful about it, you know, um, and it, it is quite um, comforting to me as well. <coughs> yeah, yeah. 
Well, um, you know, I, I know of a person I want to, I think that you sh- I'll contact her and see if she can contact you. Mm. Her name is Tammy Urbanek, U-R-B-A-N-E-K. And I will um, send her an email. I think you'd be very interested in her. She's a medium. Oh, yes, please, and yeah. um, she uh, actually, I think, does deal with the paranormal. Actually, I felt so drawn to her. Mm. I was on a podcast on another show. And the host said, oh, my gosh, you have to, uh, I never do this, but you have to read this lady's book. And I, and I uh, told her about you, and I'm telling you about okay. her. <laughs> Tell me your opinion. And yeah. so I said, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was just fascinating. I mean, it was uncanny, some of the similarities we had. So I, I'll uh, send her to mm, you. Please do. Yeah, that sounds interesting. I will. I think she would be very good for your show and also for your experiences. Thank you very much, yeah. Too. She might be able to tell me what that purple mist was all about. <laughs> she would, but definitely use the green oh, yeah, I will. staircase. Get all the clues you can. No, I, I definitely will. <laughs> And uh, I'm sure a lot of people out there listening to this show is going to be quite interested and intrigued about that. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Well, Lisa, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you. Thank you so much for coming on and uh, making it such a fantastic uh, show. Um, it's been fantastic talking to you, and it's been amazing, really. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, you know, I'm trying to get the word out mm. as much as possible because... You know, there are people out there suffering, going through similar experiences as I am. They feel helpless. They feel hopeless. They feel scared. And uh, there are, aren't are a lot of books out there about what to do, I mean, uh, or the things that work. I know these work. Yeah. So I really want to help as many people as possible. It's just It is just really, really hard to meet people. Anyone who will actually talk about these things to begin yeah. with, but then talk about it with the alien element. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, I want, didn't want to talk about it either. I didn't want to be outed as a person who is an alien abductee either. But I wanted to be able to reach the people who felt like they were having these experiences, and I couldn't ask them to come out and talk about it if I wasn't willing sure, to. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons why I did yeah. this. And so, um, yeah, it's hard. It's hard out here yeah. being one of those people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the importance. I mean, uh, it's an important issue that we should mention. Um, when when you write a book like this, it's not all about making money because I know for a fact these no. books don't make a lot of money. Um, no. Because uh, I know several authors and uh, they make a, a, a small living out of it, but not a, it's not a vast living. And I know you make you don't make a portion out of it. And I, it, it's more important for you to get that word out. I know that. That's true. That's absolutely true. And so you know, I have the IRS, but. I don't have, you know, I just really, really want all the people to have at their disposal something that they can use for their journey because I gave out the tools I need to start out and a roadmap of how I use them. How I use them might not be how you use them. You can use them any way you want and come up with your own story um, or just your own puzzle, you know, that figure, help you figure out what's going on in your life. But I really think that if people will put a little bit of work in, um, even if you're a little bit scared, I mean, then just look at your anxiety. Mm. Find out what's behind it. Find out what's behind your panic attacks. Find out what, you know, mm. uh, find out what's behind your procrastination, which I re- recently found out that it was really anxiety. I didn't know that. So I have, I have had problems with procrastination my whole mm. life. And I never understood that the underlying por- portion was anxiety. So um, find out what's behind that. Eliminate these things from your life. I mean, why not? Well, I'm glad it's worked for you anyway. <laughs> and maybe it'll work for others. <laughs> I hope so. But, and if, they, they, if it does, contact me and let me know so that we can um, maybe create a, another book saying all the ex- success stories. Sure, yeah. I mean, if you do write another book as well, um, please come back on the show and tell us about that. I definitely will. <laughs> But uh, yeah, as I said, it's been fantastic having you all these, and thank you so much for sparing the time. Um, thank we've you. We've taken up a couple of hours of your time now. But it's, uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's gone so quickly; it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and I appreciate taking up your time. And I know with the eight-hour difference, uh, it's quite a yeah, lot. Yeah, it's creeping up to my bedtime now, but it's not quite. But <laughs> I know I felt bad, and that's why I wanted to give you the 9 a.m. 
<clears throat> because you know why should you spend your whole day? No, no, know? it's it's fine. I mean, I, to me, I mean, asking you to do a show at nine a.m. in the morning is a bit out. So I thought uh, <laughs> early afternoon is a lot better for you because you're told to wake up, have a, cup, a few cups of coffee beforehand, and. Uh, <laughs> I know. I just felt bad for you having to do it at eight. No, no. Time. So, to be honest, that's the sort. Of, I mean, everyone out there. I usually do this show about eight o'clock in the evening. That's, that's, that seems to be the normal for me. Sometimes it's done at other times, maybe seven o'clock, or but very rarely in the afternoons. But it's usually you know, eight in the evening, so it's fine. It's, I don't mind. Okay. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciated <laughs> the normal time. I have uh, scheduled nine a.m.s. Uh, in the past for really? people on the east coast I, 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 so, I've yeah. got to be honest I don't think I'd like to do it at 9am <laughs> but uh, it's going to be hard but sometimes you know I mean if that's when they have the or their, if their show is at let's say 12pm uh, eastern mm. then I mean when daylight savings time hits which isn't too far away from it yeah. now It'll be 9 a.m. my yeah. time, so what can you do? That's when they're showing. <laughs> I've done a couple of really late ones when I'm sort of up at 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, when you're sort of trying to keep your eyes open. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> anyway, Lee, I'll let you go now. Thank you ever so much for coming on again. And um, Okay. So please stay in touch. I will. I definitely will. I'll send you uh, the stuff I said I would send you, plus that lady. Yeah. Uh, I'll contact yeah, Please her. do it. I'll get in touch with Solaris as well and uh, Kathleen and uh, hopefully um, give you some more contacts. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks again, Lisa, and good night to you, and take care of yourself. Well, you too. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye-bye. I hope everyone enjoyed that and found it very interesting. I certainly did. You've been listening to Paranormal Dimensions on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. I'm David Young, and I hope you'll join me again next week. Bye-bye. Paranormal Dimensions is as bright and powerful as our celestial star, the sun. And although it's expending thousands of pounds of energy every minute of the day, have no fear. There's plenty left. Dimensions is a regular feature on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network.